Okay, please open your Bibles to the book of First Peter. We are in chapter 3. First Peter, chapter 3. Uh, for the new faces, want to welcome you. Uh, so nice to see you. Thank you for spending your uh, Sunday afternoon with us. Um, make sure you spend some time after our service to uh, fellowship and to get to know us a little bit better. Uh, I, I always say that uh, when we have a lot of testimonies, it's a good Sunday. And uh, then I change that to when we have at least four. I mean, he is testifying. It's a good Sunday. Uh, maybe I'll change that again. If we have a at least four different countries and a song. <laughs> That's a good Sunday. <laughs> Maybe some more, more languages. That would be, would be nice too. Oh yeah, we had two lang three languages today. Praise the Lord. Japanese, English, and Spanish. That's heaven. That's heaven. So, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And there's Hebrew right there for you. So there's four. <laughs> We're in uh, First Peter and... Uh, uh, we had a few testimonies today on joy, the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is, uh, quite simply, happiness is based on what happens. Uh, if you have a, a good thing happening, then most likely you'll be happy. I have a new toy called the iPad. It makes me happy. Uh, but joy is based on uh, what's been done for you and uh, also what's going to be done for you. That's called the living hope. And that's what we have uh, in God, in Christ Jesus. And let me tell you something. God does not teach you joy in church. God does not teach you joy when you are sitting with your family with a nice potluck or a nice dinner and say, oh, I'm so happy. This is so joyful. God does not teach you joy uh, at a baseball game and uh, the team wins dramatically. That's not joy. God teaches you joy when it's difficult. God teaches you patience when you have to wait in the hospital room. God teaches you uh, perseverance when you're so tired you feel you have no strength left. God teaches you <clears throat> Peace, not when you're on the fishing boat and you think, oh, this is what it's all about. God teaches you peace in the middle of chaos and, and craziness. That's where you find the peace of God. God teaches you friendship and faithfulness when there's nobody else that you have left to count on except for God. And so when we're talking about joy, this is something that Peter, the author of the letter that we are studying, knows very well. And this is the theme, actually, of his book. It's not uh, so much suffering. Everybody says the theme of First Peter is suffering and how to suffer well. And yes, it's in there. But every time Peter talks about suffering, right in the next sentence, or even in the same sentence in the next phrase, he's talking about joy. Because that's where God teaches you the greatest lessons of peace, joy, love, is in those difficult times. And so uh, we're talking specifically of uh, joy in the midst of a kind of suffering that uh, most of us will experience, if you haven't already, uh, and it's in the kind of experience that we have uh, in, in conflict, in verbal, uh, conversational kind of abuse or malignment of conflict. The background is when people become Christians, even in this country, some of them go home to their mom and their dad and, and they're scared to tell them they're a Christian because they know that maybe their family will not accept that. Some of us come from countries that it's, it's no big deal. Oh, great, you've become a Christian. Wonderful. 
But in some, and, and in many parts of the world, God knows. That's the exact opposite of what you'll experience. And so God wants to equip his people in those countries and in those families, in those circumstances where, okay, it's going to be difficult to be a Christian in this family, in this company, in this country. What do we do? And then what do we do when we want to live out our faith and be faithful to God and not be silent about who we are? Because uh, some people will say, oh, you're a Christian. That's good for you. Just keep it to yourself. Be quiet about it. Go to church on your time on Sunday and uh, just leave me alone and we'll be fine. But then there's the Holy Spirit inside of us telling us, you can't keep this inside. The Word of God is to be proclaimed. It's to be spoken, and, and Jesus tells us to go out and to preach the Word and to live it out in a way that we can't be quiet about it. What do we do then? What do we do when uh, people start saying, well, keep, no, get, that, get out of here with that, that church stuff. What do we do when people start getting aggressive against us and start giving us arguments and then start giving us uh, not just arguments directly, but start giving us arguments indirectly and they start slandering you. And now it's not just because you're, it's not just, uh, because you're a Christian, but uh, it's just for who you are. And so now they're just trying to bring your reputation down verbally. What do you do then? And that's what we're getting at in our scripture today. If you haven't experienced that as a Christian, just keep, just keep going for a while, and you'll get there. It happens to, to all who, uh, who would be uh, followers of Jesus Christ. If it happened to Jesus, he says, if you want to follow me, you take up your own cross, and you deny yourself, and you follow me. It's going to happen. Uh, and for those of you who, uh, whom I know uh, personally who have already experienced this, believe me, I'm praying for you. We are praying for you. And we are with you in your struggle, in your, in your uh, uh, difficulty of trying to live your faith. And so we're in First Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 9. I don't have it for you there. Didn't have it. Uh, sorry. So it's, but it's in your bulletin. That's on the front page. Uh, I want to encourage you to bring that home with you and, and make it a good read this evening, throughout this week when you have a chance. Uh, I think the people who work on our bulletin work more than I do on, on my sermon, so uh, give them credit for that. But uh, as is my custom, I like for us to read uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 9 through 16. We've got a lot of scripture to get through, but uh, I feel God has laid it on my heart. So let's read it together, verse 9 through uh, 16. Let's read. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, Set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. The very words of God. Amen. Well, when you become a Christian, you're, what Peter says, born again into a living hope. It's you giving a new birth. It means that when you become a Christian, it's so radical 
it's so transforming that the person you were before you were a Christian is now dead. And you are a completely different person. And, and maybe you think, well, I haven't really changed much. Uh, I still speak the same language. I still look the same. I still wear the same clothes. I still have the same likes and dislikes. I haven't really changed much, much. And it's not what Peter's saying. Peter's saying it's not what's on the outside that has changed. But P- Jesus describes it as a mustard seed. It's very small. It's the smallest of the seeds. And the gospel, when it is really in you, starts that small. But then it grows and grows and becomes the biggest tree in the garden. And that's the kind of change that's happening inside those of you right now who have become a Christian. And it, it, it's a change that is in such a way, whew, hallelujah, I, I'm, just, I'm excited that I'm going to preach this that uh, it, it changes the world. Not just you, but your, your, your relationship with your spouse, your friends, and then your company, your, everyone around. It, it's that powerful. When you read your Bible, I want you to remember there's four things about human history that God is teaching us. God has a plan for all of human history. There's a beginning and there's an end. And the Bible is not a book of rules like we're reading, you know, be this, be that, be that. It's not just about that. It's a story about God and his creation and he, how he's bringing it. And the very beginning was creation. God made everything good. The earth is good. Our bodies are good. Our relationships were good. That's creation. Then there's the fall. And in Genesis chapter 3, We made it not good by our selfishness, our pride, our rebellion against God. And though all of us know we need to be good, we have to be, there's something inside of us, even though we don't know God, we never read the Bible, we feel, man, there's something here that's not right. I I think I did something wrong, there's something wrong with this planet, it's called the fall. And that's what the Bible calls the fall in in Genesis chapter 3, and the whole Bible is rife with sin all the way to Revelation chapter 21. 20, 21. So there's the creation where everything is good. There's the fall where everything is not good because of sin. And then we get to Matthew. And we get to the gospel. and, And God moves the history of humanity not from the fall, but to redemption where he buys back and rescues humanity. And he's going to return everything to good again. Okay, there's good, there's not good, there's the fall, and then there's return to good. We call that redemption. And that's where we are now in history. We are in what is called redemptive history, where Jesus came back, to satisfy the wrath of God because of our sin, to return us to good. And the fourth part of human history is restoration. And the thing is, it's already started. If you've become a Christian, you've started the process because you've been redeemed, you've been brought back to God, you've been brought back to God, and now he's restoring you. He's making you new. And then it's not just you, but it's all of us. And so that's what we need to look at when we read. Do not repay evil for evil, insult for insult. Bless those who curse you. It's interesting, Peter doesn't, is not the first one to say this. Okay? Uh, Peter uh, just kind of repeated what his Lord said. Um... But uh, I, need, I need to back up. Uh, we're not repaying evil for evil. We're not repay, we're, we're, we're paying, uh, we're paying blessing for slander. And this is the verbal. Okay, what is this response? The, the first point I'm making is is what is the response to evil and slander and insult? And that is blessing. What is the response? Blessing. Uh, and what is that? Um, 
uh, get, I love technology. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Peter's looking at Jesus on the cross in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 23. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Okay? He didn't retaliate. He didn't make any threats. Look, when people come at you, not just because you're a Christian, but just for who you are, to get at, to get at your reputation or just to, just to put you down, maybe because of your race or your country, or just because of what they misunderstood about you, they start this cycle of evil and retaliation, verbal abuse. And they start putting you down. They did that to Jesus. And Peter looks at Jesus and says, he didn't return evil for evil. That's the first thing. We're not returning. We're not setting forth the cycle of evil, of retaliation. That's, the, that's what is the blessing. That's one thing. Blessing is withholding the curse. Blessing is holding back retaliation. That's the first part of blessing. Uh, second thing, uh, Paul says it in Romans chapter 12, the, 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 the chapter that um, Erica read from. It says in verse 14 of Romans 12, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. Peter says, Jesus entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Blessing means, okay, I'm going, to I'm going to hold back my tongue and not return a curse, return an insult. That's the first part. And number two, I'm going to entrust them to God. I'm going to leave it to God. I'm going to trust that God is a just God and that he understands what I'm going through, and he does. And that's one of the blessings, one of the ways we, we respond with blessing. Let me keep going. Let me take it further. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. This is Jesus. Bless, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. So, God is saying it's not just that you entrust them to God, but now you're entrusting yourself to God because God knows where he's going to take you because he's blessed you. It is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering. Back to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. Because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? If you suffer for doing good and endure it, it is commendable before God. But rejoice. This is uh, chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Chapter 4, 13 and 14. Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of the glory of God rests on you. I'm looking for a quote from Paul that I had here. Uh, here it is, 1 Corinthians 4.12. This is very key. 1 Corinthians 4.12. When he, we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Okay, I, I have to read that one more time. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. A couple of commentators put it this way. This is so good. You're going to love this. One way that we can operate is this. When something good happens, we return good with evil. 
You return good with evil. That's called satanic. Okay? The other level is this. When something good happens, you return it with good. And when something evil happens, you return it with evil. That's called human. Okay? You return good with evil, that's satanic. You return good for good or evil for evil, that's human. When something evil happens, slander, insult, and you return it with good, that's Jesus. That's Christian. That's God. That's redemption. That's restoration. Look, follow with me. The world, people, normally operate on a system of good for good, evil for evil. Retaliation, return. Good to good, evil for evil. That's the world. That's how everybody operates. Jesus and his disciples, the Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter says, no, 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 we're on the next level. We're returning evil for good. We are stopping the cycle. Because in this world, evil is being returned for evil. And it is being perpetuated. And it gets passed from one person to one person to one person. To me, the evil gets passed to me. And I am here to stop the evil. And now the evil comes, and now I'm going to return it with good. And now God has planted me as an agent in my family, in my place of work, in my friend group, in my world, to stop the evil from continuing and to reverse it and to make it a good place to live again. Redemption, restoration. God's plan for man's history. That's us. That's a big deal. So it's not just about you and your reputation. It's not just about you and your feelings. It's not just about being slandered against or being treated wrongly for being of the wrong race or the wrong color. It's about God's plan for human history to restore it to the good that he had originally had it before. It's bigger than that. It's so big, and that's what I love about it. God is asking us not when he's saying, don't return evil for evil, insult for him, he's saying, participate in my plan to bring good to this world, to bring it back. That's what he's saying. Uh, Piper put, put it this way, not Peter Piper, John Piper. He says, uh, excuse me, he says, uh, he talks about a commercial where people are climbing up a mountain I think it's, this, it's like, like the Grand Canyon or this huge mountain in Yosemite. And these two guys are looking out at this huge, vast amount of grandness. And the one friend looks at him and says, it feels so good to be so small. You ever have that feeling? You're up in the airplane, you look down, and you're so insignificant. You, you, you're so, and it feels good. I don't know if you've had that satisfaction. You go to the Grand Canyon, and you look out, and it's just magnificent, and you are just, uh, nothing. And it feels, oh, yes, I'm, my problems are not so big. Your greatest satisfaction is not in being big. Your greatest satisfaction is in knowing bigness and being in the presence of big there's nothing bigger than God you are made for God and your your soul satisfaction and your completeness is in God and his plan and his plan for human history to restore it to good and that's a blessing we've been blessed Ephesians chapter 2 I read it this week I was so blessed he took me, I was dead, and he transformed me. He gave me new life, and now he seated me at the right hand of the Father. I'm a son of God. I'm so blessed. Why do I want to curse anyone if I'm so blessed? Okay, you can yeah, hit me with your best shot. I'm seated with God in the right hand of, of the Father. Do what you got to do. 
I'm gonna get, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop the cycle of evil, and I'm gonna return it with blessing. That's what we do. Uh, that's too much, too much, too much to go through. When Pete, when when he goes down there, uh, he quotes uh, Psalm 34. Psalm 34, uh, for whoever would uh, love his life and see good days, would keep his mouth from evil and uh, lips from disease. He's quoting David. David is in, uh, in that time, he's in a foreign country. Does that sound familiar? He's in a foreign country, and he's just crying out for the presence of God. And in that psalm, Psalm 34, a beautiful psalm, God is with those who are crushed in spirit and, and close to those who are, are broken in heart. God, he's saying, uh, when you are living under this paradigm of God restoring creation to good, God is with you. He's with you. You're in his presence. So then you can bless. Okay, I, I had to hit that point. Somebody needed to hear that. Uh, let's get practical. Uh, how do we respond with blessing? How? How do we respond when people uh, come at us? Or uh, uh, how do we get ready uh, for insult and for evil and slander? Peter is very practical. And in chapter, excuse me, in verse uh, 15, he gives us uh, three steps. Three steps. I think four. Three. Yeah, three. The first step in being able to respond with blessing to people who, who insult you is one, set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. That's number one. Set apart Christ as, G, uh, as Lord of your life. What does that mean? Look, Jesus is your Lord. For some of you, you think he's your Savior. Okay? I believe in Jesus. That's enough. I'll go to heaven. And then I'll, I'll come to church when I have to. I'll come, I'll, maybe I'll give a few dollars. That's not Lord. You're not going to live the life he has for you if you just think it's just about you coming to church every uh, now and again, giving a few dollars or a few yen every now and He's not Lord. And you're not going to be able to return blessing with ins for, for insult if he's not your Lord. You have to enjoy Jesus. You have to come to Jesus with broken heart, being able to give your life to him, okay? You have to be able to sing with a whole heart. God says, they come to me, they sing these songs, but their hearts are far from me. I don't need that. You have to make Jesus your Lord. He's not going to be your Savior if he's not going to be your Lord. That means he's your master, that means in your, in your relationships with your wife, he's your Lord. In relationship with your husband, he is your Lord. In relationships with your kids, he is your Lord. Obey him. And so what does it mean that Jesus is Lord? One, we worship him. Two, we obey him. That's what, Jesus, that's what it means when Jesus is our Lord. We set him apart as Lord. If you can do that, you're on the right way to being able to withstand insult, slander, and evil. If Jesus is your Lord. That's number one. Number two, be prepared, he says. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Get ready. For those of you who are foreigners, listen to me right now. You will be insulted by the, because of the color of your skin and because of your last name whether you're in this country or in another country. You will be insulted. Get ready for it. Be prepared with a good answer, not an evil answer. Be prepared to receive it with grace and with mercy and say, Lord Jesus, I leave it, I leave it to you. Get ready for that. For those of you who interact with foreigners, be prepared to be misunderstood and to have miscommunication and to have mistranslation. Get ready. Be prepared and understand. We are sinners interacting with sinners. It's not going to go well. Get ready for that. Be prepared. But not just be prepared uh, with answers, but uh, Peter says specifically, for the hope that you have that, that's in you. Uh, I, when, I, when I interviewed at my, my school, my school right now is a Catholic school. I work at a Catholic school, 
I make it evidently plain, I'm a Protestant believer. And so I was being interviewed by the father of the school, a Catholic priest, Jesuit, loves Jesus. And he, he asked me during my interview, he said, are you okay with working at a Catholic school since you're a, a Protestant Christian? The day before that, that interview, my wife and I practiced my interview because I needed to practice my, my Japanese. And so if they asked me, why do you want to work here, I had to say, uh, uh, <laughs> I had to be able to say that. And then uh, I, we, we rehearsed the question. And he asked the exact same question to me in the interview. And I was ready. I was re you know what I said? I said, look, I'll say it in English. I said, hey, we're living, this is a country of less than 1% Christian. The fact that I believe is more important than anything. And in fact, we believe in Jesus, the cross, we believe in the essentials, the trinity, the deity of Christ. <laughs> We're on the same team. We're okay. Oh, no, so <laughs> nice. Check. Uh, I, get, get ready. Be prepared with an answer for the hope that's in you. You have a hope. Uh, we have, uh, the, uh, uh, there's a gift that Pastor Hiroshi gave to us for our house, our new house. Beautiful picture of Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus out of Luke, I think 24. Uh, it's just this beautiful picture. It, he even framed it for us. And we put it in our, in our Gankon so that when people come to our house and they, they get ready to go, they, they, ha they have to, to look at that picture. We want that picture to be seen. It's a picture of Jesus. We also have a cross right in the most prominent place in our house as well. We want people to ask us, what does this cross mean? And what's this picture about? And we, we practice our answers in Japanese. And we practice our answers not just for believers, but we want to practice our answers for non-believers. We want to be prepared. That's the second thing. I've got to keep going. Here's the biggest thing. If you don't get this, you're not going to be ready at all. Step three, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. We are not out to win arguments. We are out to win people. People. Uh, this thing, uh, yeah, well, anyways. We, uh, this, this is the craziest thing. In my, in my uh, school, just this last Monday, we had a Bible study in my school. It's a Catholic school, and there's, about a, there's a few Christian teachers there who love Jesus and want to share the gospel, the Bible, with the other non-Christian faculty. So they had an open Bible. This is the second one, actually. It's about once a month. And I attended this my first time. It was awesome. It was supposed to be an hour. It went an hour and a half because we studied um, the Good Samaritan. And they're just going back and forth, having a discussion. The non-Christians there were writing notes, asking questions. And I'm sitting there, I've got I to gotta practice my, my Nihongo, how I'm going to answer. And eventually they came to me. They said, Habakon Sensei, do you want to know? Huh? This <laughs> conversation is how it's going. So, I'm telling you, I, was, I had a sermon ready to go. This is, this is a good Samaritan, right? And I wanted to just blast them. It's not about morality. It's about Jesus. He's the best Samaritan. You got to give your life. No, 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 no. You know, I wanted to go at it. But I was studying this scripture. And Peter's telling me gentleness and respect. <laughs> gentleness and respect. Okay. So this, nah. Ah, And I'm trying to just do it with just this just quiet and gentle spirit. I hope I didn't come off as proud, haughty, arrogant, know-it-all, Bible-preaching you know, Christian. I don't want to do that. Peter says, with gentleness and respect, they're going to come at you. Evil's going to come at you. Slander, persecution, coming at your reputation, coming against who you are. We don't need to fight back with a fist. We answer back with a gentle and humble heart. That's what happens. And the result is they'll be ashamed for the slander because of your good behavior.
All right, that's the promise of, of Peter. Now, this is in the context of, of non, non-believers, okay? Our church, our, our little Ingress congregation, we're, get, we're growing a little bit. We're in a season of people coming. That's wonderful. We've had it before. And this is one of my biggest prayers, that we become even closer as we become bigger. That when more people come, we get even deeper in our relationships with each other. What does that mean? Well, we, we fellowship with each other. We spend time downstairs on Sundays, uh, just getting to know each other as much as possible. Two, we meet at each other's homes, uh, at Bible studies. We try to fellowship with each other as much as possible to live and do life with each other. Now, here's what's going to happen when you do this. When you're in community with each other and you start really doing life with each other, you're going to insult each other. Okay? In fact, I know. I've probably insulted more of you than I even think. And you, some of you, get on my nerves as well. Okay? And I won't, here's what I want to do. I want to ask you to forgive me. If I've said something stupid or, or, in, or insensitive, please forgive me. But look, we're going to get closer and closer. That's my, my deepest desire and prayer to God. I pray for that every day. But when we insult each other, when we hurt each other, when we, when we cross each other's line, look, we're about to come to the body and the blood. Forgive as Jesus forgave you. His blood washes you from all your sin and makes you part of this new community called the, the church. And when you partake of the the cup, you say, Jesus, your blood washes me clean, and I'm clean. But when you take, partake of this bread, you identify with his body, suffered and broken for you, the church of Christ. The church of Christ is the body of Jesus. And if we can't reconcile with each other for things that we say, it was a big deal to him, small thing to her but we need to reconcile that. We can't take this the right way. Brothers and sisters, I know we, we hardly know each other still, and maybe, Chris, what are you talking about? <laughs> I, nobody here has insulted me. Just in case, okay? <laughs> Just in case. A Facebook comment, um, a passing comment, I don't know. But please, let's look, let's be humble and gentle and respectful to each other for the sake of the body of Jesus Christ. I want you to consider that as we come uh, to the table today. Uh, Do we have the, the slides ready for that?